I'm going to jump right in. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting when we think about video and, and its power, you know, we usually don't think about numbers right away. And so when you see numbers like 83%, 11%, 3%, 2%, 1%, you're like, what does that have to do with video and driving engagement with, with sight and sound? Well, the reality is, is that our perception is based on our senses. And we rely 83% on how we perceive the world is based on sight. 11% is sound. And then three, two, and one for, I guess, your smell, your taste, and your touch, or your touch and your taste, your smell. But <laughs> that was funny. Video is one of those tools that really is engaging, and it's an engaging for it's engaging because we rely so much on our sight and our sound, and it really captures your attention. And I think that you know when you think about why we watch and stick and stare at video, it is because it's engaging and it's actually tying into some primal things that go all the way back millennia of when everything was communicated via word of mouth. So I got to show you an example and uh, for the speakers in the room, I apologize. I hope this doesn't offend any of you, but please have fun watching it. Walk on stage, walk on stage, walk on stage, walk on stage. I am a thought leader. You know that I'm a thought leader because I'm wearing a blazer, I have glasses, and I've just done this with my hands. I will now walk over to my laptop. By doing so, I'm demonstrating to you that as a thought leader, I understand technology and that there will be slides. Because everybody knows that a presentation seems more legitimate than it actually is if there are slides. I'm now going to come back to the center of the stage and give you some unremarkable context about how I became a thought leader. If it's okay with you, I'd like to pace while telling you this story. In 2009, I met a thought leader and I asked him, how did you become a thought leader? And you know what he said? He said, I don't know. Now that doesn't sound important and it's not, but if I repeat it three times, I'm making you believe that it is important. He said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let's look at a picture of the planet for no reason. It's nice, isn't it? That's where we live. So, I put on a sports jacket so that I would be a thought leader. <laughs> you know, the, the point of that video is not, you know, really, I mean, not at all what he's talking about. The point of that video in my talk is that you were engaged, you were pulled in. He used things like the way he walked, the way he presented himself, and you began to judge him right away as to whether he was a thought leader or not, even though he was literally talking about nothing. I mean, it's kind of amazing. And it's that type of engagement that video creates for us and is why marketers and thought leaders and product companies and authors and uh, you name it. I mean, we've done videos for all types of businesses and it's why they're jumping on the bandwagon of trying to create video. Everybody's seen YouTube. Everybody's been on YouTube. In fact, one third of the internet, of all internet users are on YouTube. That's a billion people are on YouTube. They stream a billion views a day. Every minute, 500 hours, every minute, 500 hours are uploaded to, to YouTube. Now, if we were to sit down and take the 20 minutes that I'm talking and watch those 500 hours that were uploaded every, every minute, that would be over a year that we would sit at our computer screens 24 hours a day, seven days a week to be able to capture all the video that's uploaded. Another interesting stat is that in the last 60 days, more content has been uploaded to YouTube than all of the major TV cable network, cable TV networks have produced in the last 60 years. 
60 days, 60 years. It's amazing the amount of content that's being uploaded. One of the things that have been uploaded, and he truly is a, a thought leader, is a gentleman by the name of Chris Anderson. And Chris is the curator for TED. And I was first introduced to some of his thought leadership through a video about video and how it is creating innovation and collaboration and exploding the way that we collaborate and innovate online. And in that video, he shows examples of where street dancers are watching other street dancers from around the world to learn moves that they could never communicate in any other way. And he uses this one example of a six-year-old little boy who's never taken a dance list lesson that is combining all these things and just doing incredible dance moves. Another example is in science, where he's using microbiologists who are filming what they're seeing under a microscope very detailed cellular level stuff that there's absolutely no way they could communicate that in any other way other than video. To try to write it down and describe it to someone else would be impossible. In that video, he uses a quote, video is high bandwidth for a reason. It packs a huge amount of data and our brains are uniquely wired to decode it. That's it. We are made from the beginning of time to be able to analyze what we see and hear. And that's one of the reasons it's so powerful. I mentioned earlier that face-to-face -face or word-of-mouth communication was the mainstream for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, it didn't change until the, advent, the invention of the printing press. That's when, 500 years ago, that we actually changed the way we communicated to the written word. Before that, all great ideas were distributed by people talking like this to audiences and crowds. It's very engaging. A quote from a PR consultant that I read an article recently in Forbes. Viewers not are not only more likely to engage with your visual content, they are also able to make personal connections with you by watching your videos. I want to show you an example of how that works. These are a few faces that many of us know and have seen. And we all, all of these faces, especially now that the Olympics just happened, we actually know more about them. It's not just their athletic skills and those things. We've seen them be interviewed. In Michael Phelps' case, we've seen him grow up on the television. I mean, he's 16 years ago. He's 32. He was 16 years old when we started watching this kid grow up. And we've seen his trials and tribulations. Here's another group of people. Now when you look at those folks, how many people recognize one or more of those folks on the screen? How many of you, the first time you looked up there, didn't say, you know, said, that's Allison, that's uh, Meredith Gray, that's Mike Ross, that's uh, Darius, I can't ever say it, but Game of Thrones. I mean, we don't even, we're connecting with these people who are fictional characters and we're concerned what's gonna happen in their life next and they're not even real people. You know, I can't name their real names. In fact, I can't even name their actor, their character names. Now, business owners and business leaders have been using this technique as well. Most of you recognize at least two, if not three of those. Steve Jobs, we watched him unfold some great technology and he did it online and he did it via video every time. I remember back in the 80s watching at Fox, at the Fox, an announcement of some products that he was rolling out. I mean, it was an amazing thing to see it live for the first time when he was rolling stuff out. And later, we thought we knew him, and later we found out that he was quite a different person than what the public persona was, but he still did that. Uh, you know, of course, Richard Branson, everybody knows. Who knows this woman? So she's the CEO of Yahoo. How many of you guys recognize the guy in the upper right-hand corner? This will help everyone. And the reason you recognize him is because you see him every time you take a flight. He greets you and thanks you for flying Delta. Now, for those of you who don't know, he's no longer the CEO, he's the executive chairman, and there's a new CEO, and I'm curious to whether or not he will do videos or not. But what I thought was amazing is not only did the 180 million people that will flew on Delta every year hear and greet and get to know Richard Anderson, who else heard that and saw that video every day, multiple times a day? His employees. So he was using video as a way, and oh by the way, I don't think most of his tenure, the relationship between the flight attendants and the pilots was pretty good. Because they heard and saw him. They may have never met him in person, but you know what, they knew his voice and they knew what he looked like. I call that the, uh, 
I feel like I know you effect by seeing you on video. True story, uh, several weeks ago I was at a Chick-fil-A and somebody came up to me and said, you're that V-Link guy, right? And I had no idea who he was. And this is a true story. He had been watching our video blogs. He was in our database somehow and we were sending emails out and he was watching our video blogs and he recognized me at a Chick-fil-A. So the question is, is how do we create content that can actually drive engagement and make people pay attention to what we're doing. It's not all of the things that we saw. The, it has to actually be interesting content. So what I want to do is spend the next few minutes that I have kind of running through some things to, to show you how you can create compelling content. And, you know, first off, you just need to do it. I mean, you need to be creating video. If you're not, you should be, uh, even if it's just for internal purposes. And it doesn't have to be done by professionals, even though we would prefer that. Um, number one. And I'm not going to keep count because I will lose count. But the first one is know your audience. I'm going to tell you a real quick story. How many of you guys have seen this billboard at some point in your life? Or the, the old, some of us old folks remember, oh, crying eyes. So the Ad, Ad Council came out and put together a program to try and clean up America. And they used this actor who would cry at the end. It was a real emotional plea. And we, you know, especially upper middle class, we connected and we started cleaning up the streets. We started taking care, we started recycling. But the guy that drove that truck, Bubba, in Texas, thought it, you know, he didn't connect. It didn't matter to him at all. So they came out with a new campaign. Don't mess with Texas. Do you think Bubba got a hold of that one? Also, Bubba stops regularly. That's his takeout, not toss out. He stops at fast food all the time. So it definitely worked to, to their advantage. So the first thing you should always do is know your audience. Know who you're speaking to. Number two, get over yourself. You don't have a face for radio. I mean, you know, the, the, we hear this all the time. I've got a face for radio. I'm just not good on camera. I get nervous. And you worry about what you look like or you worry about how you sound. If you make sales calls or you meet with customers or you talk, guess what? They're meeting you already. They know what you look like in real life. Seeing you on video is not going to change their opinion of you, right? So just get over yourself. Quit talking about yourself. How many of you have been to a cocktail party and you came up and there's that one lady in your neighborhood or that one networker and they walk up and all they do is talk about themselves? Oh, my boys, Johnny they and, and Sammy, they are such great ball players. You should see them. They're going to go to college one day. And the whole time you're standing there, she never asked, do you even have children? Are you married? Never asked a single question. They only talk about themselves. The first thing you want to do the next time you see her is turn and run the other way. So quit talking about yourself. I love this quote, people don't care how much you know until they know that you care. And the only way they're gonna know that is if you talk about what matters to them. And it doesn't matter if you're doing video or you're writing emails, they don't care what you sell. They wanna know what's in it for them. Talk about them, what are their needs. In the marketing world, one of the things that you try to do is elevate the conversation. You wanna get above the noise, be above products and benefits, features and benefits. You want to really try to impact your client's businesses. I'm not going to read the entire quote, but the, the goal is to really create commercial insight, even going beyond thought leadership and insight, but commercial insight. Commercial insight is that that makes a business difference in the industry or for that business. And when you put that in your content, guess what? It's going to be more engaging and more compelling. And that means you're going to give away some trade secrets, perhaps. You're going to talk about some things that you may not talk about everywhere, but you're going to try to trend things and make things different. Keeping it personal is pretty important because when you can associate the viewer's needs to that commercial insight, this happens. And what happens there is you've got com personal commercial insight, which means I, as the individual, am going to benefit from that. You're going to tap into something that they want or they need or they understand, and it is going to make a difference in their life, whether it's an HR or it's, uh, it's, it's the engineer or it's the frontline sales guy. You're making a difference in their life, and you want to communicate that by giving them value. Delivery matters. There are all different ways to deliver content. 
You need to know where your audience is. You need to know how you deliver it. You want to use email. You want to use email signatures. You want to put it on your blog. You want to put it on your web page. You want to put it on your, on your social media. You want to put it on YouTube. And you need to have a strategy around that. And when you deliver it properly, it will make a difference because more and more people are going to see it. And you're going to get the I feel like I know you effect that I got. Now, I chose this picture because how many of you, the first instant you saw that went, oh, what a cute little baby. I know I did. And that's because we want to, we want to embrace emotion. Now, emo all emotion is not about tearjerker and, and those types of emotions. Some emotions are tied to passion or tied to, uh, sometimes it's tied to greed, you know, a fight or flight. You know, th those things come into play when you're driving with emotion. Uh, I love this analogy because that elephant's going to go wherever he wants to go, and that rider has nothing to do with it, right? Absolutely, the elephant has got the control. And when you think about how you make decisions, your emotions drive your decisions more often than reason. Impulse purchases are great, right? But anyway, I've got another video that ties all this together, and, and then we'll talk about it briefly and I'll wrap up. So let's watch this. This is actually one of our clients. We put this together, and I'm not going to set it up too much except for that this company is trying to change an industry. Please watch this. I think the miracle of telehealth and telemedicine is that telemedicine gives us the ability to erase time and distance. I think it'll be on our smartphones. I think the blood pressure checks and uh, blood sugar checks and things like that will become automated on our phones. And it really takes the I out of healthcare and it puts the we into it. So when you put we in the healthcare, it, it turns into well care. So we really think that telemedicine will help us all. Um, take better care of our populations. I mean, I think that we can use technology to our advantage. Um, all the stuff that we're scared about, I think we're going to figure out. I'm really positive about that. The, the, the neat thing about telemedicine is there doesn't seem to be many boundaries. So what you really need is you need people, visionaries, you need people who are willing to think out of the box. And the future of telemedicine is endless. When you look around and you realize how many people have smartphones and iPads, and electronic devices. Where telemedicine is going, there is just no end in sight. So the Georgia Partnership for Telehealth is a company that, that enables telemedicine. They know their audience. They know their audience are healthcare providers and school nurses and large businesses who want to provide better health services in rural or remote areas. And they're using this as a way to continue to communicate that to their audience. You saw a story in there. There was a storyline. There was emotion. There was passion. This is a great example. And oh, by the way, some of those folks didn't know they were going to be on video that day, so they had to get over themselves. The bottom line is, is that when you can tell your message and wrap it in a story, you can compel people to action. And that's what the goal of any type of content is. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.